Good evening and welcome to Point in Commons, fourth in a series of presentations intended to advance ideas that stimulate and motivate actions, create excitement, raise public investment, uh, all to improve education in the community. Uh, tonight's event is sponsored by, and the, their logos are on the screen in front of you, the Stevens Point Public School District, the School of Education, College of Professional Studies at UWSP, Mid-State Technical College, the Community Foundation of Central Wisconsin, Phi Delta Kappa International, uh, the Stevens Point Area Catholic Schools, Century Insurance, and Oak Ridge Family Farms. Uh, this is a pretty informal event, folks, um, and I had dinner with Harry, he doesn't bite. So if you, want, if you are comfortable and wanna come down a little closer to stage, that would be great. This year's theme for Point Uncommon is Unplugged, Disconnect to Reconnect. Uh, or our theme this year was inspired um, by a YouTube video called Look Up. Uh, we share this video with you tonight to set the stage for tonight's presentation. Eric, if you would play the video, please. I have 422 friends, yet I'm lonely. I speak to all of them every day, yet None of them really know me. The problem I have sits in the spaces between looking into their eyes or at a name on a screen. I took a step back and opened my eyes. I looked around and realised that this media we call social is anything but when we open our computers and it's our doors we shut. All this technology we have, it's just an illusion. Community companionship, a sense of inclusion. Yet when you step away from this device of delusion, you awaken to see a world of confusion. A world where we're slaves to the technology we mastered, where information gets sold by some rich, greedy bastard. A world of self-interest, self-image, self-promotion, where we all share our best bits, but leave out the emotion. We're at our most happy with an experience we share, but is it the same if no one is there? Be there for your friends, and they'll be there too, but no one will be if a group message will do. We edit and exaggerate, crave adulation. We pretend not to notice the social isolation. We put our words into order until our lives are glistening. We don't even know if anyone is listening. Being alone isn't a problem. Let me just emphasize, if you read a book, paint a picture, or do some exercise, you're being productive and present, not reserved and recluse. You're being awake and attentive and putting your time to good use. So when you're in public and you start to feel alone, put your hands behind your head, step away from the phone. You don't need to stare at your menu or at your contact list. Just talk to one another, learn to coexist. I can't stand to hear the silence of a busy commuter train where no one wants to talk through the fear of looking insane. We're becoming unsocial. It no longer satisfies to engage with one another and look into someone's eyes. We're surrounded by children who, since they were born, have watched us living like robots and think it's the norm. It's not very likely you'll make world's greatest dad if you can't entertain a child without using an iPad. When I was a child, I'd never be home. Be out with my friends on our bikes, we would roam. I'd wear holes in my trainers and graze up my knees. We'd build our own clubhouse high up in the trees. Now the park's so quiet, it gives me a chill. See no children outside and the swings hanging still. There's no skipping, no hopscotch, no church and no steeple. We're a generation of idiots smartphones and dumb people. So look up from your phone, shut down the display. Take in your surroundings, make the most of today. Just one real connection is all it can take to show you the difference that being there can make. Be there in the moment that she gives you the look that you remember forever as when love overtook. The time she first holds your hand or first kiss your lips. The time you first disagree but still love her to bits. The time you don't have to tell hundreds of what you've just done because you want to share this moment with just this one. The time you'll sell your computer so you can buy a ring for the girl of your dreams who is now the real thing. The time you want to start a family and the moment when you first hold your little girl and get to fall in love again. The time she keeps you up at night and all you want is rest and the time you wipe away the tears as your baby flees the nest. The time your baby girl returns with a boy for you to hold and the time he calls you granddad and makes you feel real old. The time you take in all you've made just by giving life attention and how you're glad you didn't waste it by looking down at some invention. The time you hold your wife's hand, sit down beside her bed. You tell her that you love her, lay a kiss upon her head. 
She then whispers to you quietly as her heart gives a final beat that she's lucky she got stopped by that lost boy in the street. But none of these times ever happened. You never had any of this. When you're too busy looking down, you don't see the chances you miss. So look up from your phone, shut down those displays. We have a finite existence, a set number of days. Don't waste your life getting caught in the net as when the end comes, nothing's worse than regret. I am guilty too of being part of this machine, this digital world we are heard but not seen, where we type as we talk and we read as we chat, where we spend hours together without making eye contact. So don't give in to a life where you follow the hype, give people your love, don't give them your like. Disconnect from the need to be heard and defined, go out into the world, leave distractions behind. Look up from your phone, shut down that display. Stop watching this video, live life the real way. Based on your reaction, I think uh, it's clear that the video is, is powerful. I would encourage you to go to YouTube and play it another time or two because you'll pick up some things that you missed tonight. Um, tonight's presenter is author and UW professor Harry Brighouse. Harry is a professor of philosophy and educational studies. Uh, he also teaches applied ethics, political philosophy, and the philosophy of education as well as a first year class on children, marriage, and the family. Professor Brighouse has been a Carnegie Scholar and a senior advisor to the Spencer Foundation. He's also written or edited several books, including School Choice and Social Justice, On Education and Family Values, The Ethics of the Parent-Child Relationships. Professor Brighouse has said that how we educate students needs to match why we educate them. He went on to say that it requires considerable change in what we teach, how we teach, and in the way all schools are organized. We believe that you'll find Professor Brighouse's comments on education this evening interesting and thought-provoking. Please give a warm Central Wisconsin welcome to author and professor Harry Brighouse. Thank you for <coughs> having me. Um, I have this, uh, it isn't that I'm super pretentious and just trying to mock his accent or something, the, the, the guy in the video. This is actually uh, my accent. Um, so I'm just a little bit nervous. Ah, good. Now, now I've got that. Um, thank you for having me. I, I, um, I'm always a little uneasy when people invite me to give talks because um, you always think, do they, you know, I'm a philosopher. I'm, and philosophers don't know anything. So do you actually really want to hear a talk by somebody who doesn't know anything? Um, so I'll, well, you can find out. I mean, you know, you'll, you'll see later. Uh, I'm going to start, actually, uh, the, the talk comes in two parts. There's one which will be about why we educate children, and there'll be another about how we, how we should do it. Um, but I'm going to start with a test. I can't really see your hands, so maybe it'll just be a test where you have to sort of... Uh, do it in your head. But the first, uh, the test is, um, which of these is a school? Um, so how many of you think that the, uh, the one with the green roof is a school? And how many of you think that the ugly, brutal building there that looks like a prison is a school? Yeah, you, you, you know more than you uh, are letting on. So in fact, the, the top one is a prison. Um, <laughs> It's a prison, but it's a prison in Canada. Um, and the bottom one is a, an elementary school in Ohio. So just um, do the test so that you sort of get in your, in your heads what we're thinking about. What we do is we take these little people um, who are all under 18. I know the 18-year-olds aren't little, but, you know, the ones under are. And we um, tell them, okay, you're going to spend 15, maybe 18,000 hours of your childhood in that building there, the one that actually looks like a prison. Um, 
Uh, and uh, we force them into that place and we put them in with maybe 20 if you're lucky, maybe 25, maybe 30. In my case, I was in a, a, an elementary school class of 50 children with one adult in the room. Um, and you know, some of those children are bullies and some of them are totally oppositional and some of them are dysfunctional, which is fine. It's, it's okay to be dysfunctional. I, I, I've been there too. Um, uh, but as an adult, you're rarely forced by anybody to spend 15,000 or 18,000 hours of your time anywhere, especially with a whole bunch of people, many of whom don't like you. Um, not that I, <laughs> you're learning a lot about my childhood. Um, uh, uh, or are disruptive or violent or whatever. Um, they, we don't do that very often. We do it when you commit a felony. Um, but for children, we just do it routinely. Now, I will just say, I think it's a good thing that we do it. Um, I'm a big fan of making children go to school. If we didn't make them go to school, who knows what they would be doing. They certainly, most of them wouldn't be learning. I wouldn't have learned anything if I hadn't gone to school. Um, but when you uh, force people to do things for that amount of time, um, you've got to think hard about why you're doing that and how you're doing it. You better jolly well make good use of that time of theirs that you're um, otherwise depriving them of. Okay, so uh, let's... Um, ah, oh, there we are. I'm supposed to point. So, let, I, Miss Higgins here is going to recur a few times in the, um, in the course of the talk. Um, and the question Miss Higgins has for me, um, because she hasn't learned that I'm a philosopher and don't really know anything, is what should I be doing with these children? Uh, she, wants, she, she doesn't really want to know the why, but she does want to know the what and the how. Um, and what I'm going to do is, first of all, take you through three... In order to answer how we should educate them, we have to think about why we're educating them. So I'm going to start by taking you through uh, two justifications at first. Um, which I think are very common, very popularly held, and both are wrong. Um, and then I'll offer you, of course, that's what philosophers do. You tell them what people what's wrong, and then you tell them what you believe without actually explaining why. Um, so the first, uh, the first um, answer to the question why we should educate, uh, you'll all recognize um, uh, your former president. He said this when he was uh, still vice president. Um, we're living in a world and at a pitch of crisis that put an ultimate premium on sheer brain power, fully developed and unstintingly applied. We dare not misapply it. We dare not be satisfied with standards of mediocrity. And this, is, this is a variant of what I call the imp economic imperative answer to the question of why we should educate. We should educate because we want a competitive economy and we've got to educate people in order that they will be... Um, generate the economic growth that we need in order to have a, a competitive economy. Um, second, uh, so lots of people, I think, think that. Uh, if, you, if you look through Obama's speeches or look through any presidential candidate speeches, you'll find that same sort of rhetoric. Um, actually, a rather older kind of answer um, was offered by Horace Mann, who was really sort of the founder, I think, of American public schooling. Um, and he gives an answer, you can read it yourselves, um, which I think of as not, not an economic imperative, but a kind of preserving democracy imperative. And you hear people saying this a lot. People say, well, we want, we want children to become good citizens. Um, uh, democracy needs an educated public. Uh, and I agree, I, 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 it does. And I agree that we do want our children to be good citizens. Um, I've sort of maybe made... The, uh, these answers are a little bit more formal here. Um, but I think they're both wrong answers. And I think that if you answer the question this, these ways, you go wrong in what you end up teaching the children. So why are they wrong? So think about the first one. So the first one really is about the importance of economic growth. Now, economic growth is important. Don't get me wrong. Economic well-being is important. It's important to have... Uh, anybody who's lived in poverty knows living in poverty is bad. Societies that live uh, without some level of wealth um, are unhappy places. Uh, but there are two problems here. So one is that, in fact, it turns out that if you care... If, if what you care about is how well-off people are, if you care about how um, uh, 
flourishing they are, how sort of uh, well their lives go, the relationship between economic growth and uh, that is actually quite uh, uneven. So, for example, now I, I should have put the graph on the... There are, there are lights on me so you can see what I'm doing, but I should have put gra the graph in the slideshow, but I didn't. So, in fact, if you look at uh, a country like the U.S., and you look at answers to questions about um, subjective well-being. So you ask people, are you happy, Un you know, unhappy, somewhat happy, happy, very happy. Um, uh, you get a direct, the graph goes up like that until about 1953. So it goes up with economic growth. People, the, the, the level of happiness people report goes up with economic growth until about 1953, and then it goes like that. Now, the economic growth line keeps going up like that, but the happiness uh, completely levels off. In uh, Britain, I think the year is 1956. In Japan, it's 1962. They kept getting happier until 1962, and then it levels off. Um, uh, and it's not... I, people have longer lives, so that gives them longer to be unhappy, maybe. Uh, um, uh, so it's not as though... And, and longer life is good. Um, uh, but... It's a very uneven um, relationship. There's also no account here of the distribution. So if you just cared about economic growth um, and having high GDP, there are some countries that have high GDP, but that GDP is concentrated among a very small number of people, um, whereas other people in the society have very little of it. It's hard to say that the economic growth is working for everybody when some people have very little of the, uh, of, of the income that we've created. Um, and, you know, look at the U.S. Uh, in 1970 uh, compared with the U.S. in 2010. Uh, almost all of the gains of growth between, 1910, uh, between 1970 and 2010, almost all of the gains of growth went to the top 5% of the income distribution. So almost nobody lower than that. Of course, they have, you know, they've got better fridges and they've got better cars and this, that, and the other. But they don't have um, uh, more money when you uh, account for inflation, or not much more. Second question, the second answer. I'm not happy with the second answer. Simply, of course, I do think we need good citizens, and I think education plays an important role in that. Um, I, just citizenship is only part of life. There's an election coming up. Um, and if you've thought hard about the uh, candidates and you've really learned something about it and you're happy about that, you should probably vote in it. If you haven't already, some people have already voted. It was my first American election that I got to vote in. So I voted already because my wife told me to. Um, uh, I won't tell you how I voted, uh, except that I will say that unlike many of my colleagues, I did not write myself in for Attorney General. Um, I have many colleagues who write me in for Attorney General which shows that they really don't care about that race, I think. Um, uh, I think there's a much better answer than either of these answers. And I think the answer I'm going to give is the one that you all believe, which is handy, because then I don't really have to argue for it. Um, I, I think what we care about, if, if you're going to subject children to that 15 to 18,000 hours in that horrendous building, um, they've got to get something out of it. What we want is we want people to live successful, flourishing lives. Um, and we want people to live successful, flourishing lives, whatever part of the income distribution they started off in, um, whatever kind of social background they have, whatever sex they are, whatever race they are, whatever sexuality they have. Um, uh, what we want is we want to ensure um, that they're successful, and we think education has an important part in that. And of course, in order to be successful in um, Modern societies, you have to be able to participate in the economy effectively. So don't get me wrong, there's an economic side to this. And, of course, in order to contribute to the success of other people, you have to be a good citizen. You have to obey the laws, that's part of good citizenship. I, I mean, obey most of the laws most of the time. All right? So not necessarily all the laws all the time. And, of course, in some unjust societies, you better bloody well... Sorry, I shouldn't swear. It's all right, you don't recognise that as swearing, do you, bloody? It's just some odd Englishism. Um... Uh, you know, you better break the laws occasionally, but do it in a sensible way, in a way that's sort of not self-interested, but uh, aimed at uh, creating the right kind of change. Uh, so, if people disagree with me, they can disagree with me afterwards. Uh, 
So that's why we should educate. Um, there is a question that you might ask, and Miss Higgins does ask in my imagined dialogue with her, which is, yeah, okay, you say that we're educating in order to get children to flourish and contribute appropriately to the flourishing of others. Well, what's flourishing? Come on, Brighouse, give us an answer. And my answer is, I'm not going to write a 1,000-page book about that. Um, but I do think that the, um, we, we've got a lot of fairly high-quality uh, research in both economics and psychology now that tells us a lot about what makes people happy. Um, and uh, I'll just sort of review uh, the, the seven main factors that economists and psychologists tell us um, make people happy. And of course, I don't think, being a philosopher, I don't think happiness is flourishing. I don't think it counts as flourishing if you get it with a pill. Um, and you know, there are, I, I, I talked to a friend recently who took ecstasy. Um, and sh she says, yeah, you can get happiness with a pill. Um, she says it's a really good deal. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to try. Um, uh, but, but happiness, I think, does give us a guide. Happ that, uh, what makes people happy in real lives gives us a guide to what makes them flourish. Um, and people need that seem to need the following things. So first of all, uh, you need sound finances. Uh, people don't flourish when they're under the constant stress that poverty creates for them. They also need successful family relationships. Uh, the the guy in the poem said, the guy with the poem said, we're at our most happy with experiences we share. Um, and all of the um, literature on happiness. Uh, supports that. So uh, having successful, well-functioning, familial, intimate relationships and having uh, relationships that are less intimate with friends, um, with uh, people in your community, feeling at one with your community, feeling at ease in your community, um, those turn out to be very important um, contributors to happiness. Um, Personal freedom is important. It's important to, be able to, to not be completely restricted in what you do and when you do it. Um, being under the control of other people, which remember, in the bottom end of the labor market, if you look at sort of the bottom 30, 40% of the labor market, you're constantly in the control of other people. Me, I have the kind of job, um, I mean, I have an extraordinary kind of job where I get a job security that I don't think anybody pretty much should have. Um, Certainly, I shouldn't have it. Uh, I get an income. I think probably some people should get my income, but I doubt that somebody who does what I do should. Um, but what I get, what the big, uh, I get enormous control over what I do day to day and within the day. Um, I get to talk to the people I want to talk to. I get to think about the things I want to think about. Now, that is a real recipe. I mean, of course, it can be a recipe for... Um, disaster, but in, by and large, it's a recipe for having a pretty well-functioning life. If you're under the control of other people, you rarely have that kind of success, you know, that, that kind of uh, advantage. It's important to be able to live by your personal values and to have values that you live by. Um, now, of course, there are some values that are bad and bad to live by, uh, but it's important that you have some sort of standards that you hold yourself to it's important that you be able to uh, follow through. Health is tremendously important, um, as anybody who's been seriously ill knows, even if, you, even if you haven't been seriously ill. Think about how you feel sort of three days into a really bad cold. Um, I mean, I think about that when I'm three days into a bad cold, and I'm always thinking, is it going to turn into pneumonia? Not because I'm, I'm not wimpy. It's like often it does turn into pneumonia, so I've learned that. And I, um, uh, but, you know, you think... If, it, if, it, if this were my life forever, well, I'd carry on with it, but it wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be that thrilled about it. Um, uh, and mental ill health in particular is really hard to live with. It's hard to be happy and successful and flourish with mental ill health. Um, and meaningful work is important. Um, turns out to be important. It's important that you be able to work, uh, that you believe that you're contributing to other people, the work does not have to be paid work. It doesn't have to be economically valued work. And I think we know that some, uh, some of the work in our society that is really important gets paid much less well than some of the work that is not really important. Um, so we want to... Uh, and, and some people who have meaningless work, 
even if they're well paid for it, um, really feel a hit in terms of their happiness. It, it, it really can... Um, the, the fa screenwriters... So there's this literature about, there's this literature about um, the effects of certain kind of status on your longevity. So there's a very famous study of Oscar winners, Academy Award winners. And in every major category, um, the winner, if you compare the winners of the Academy Awards with the people who were nominated but didn't win, the winners live a lot longer, a remarkable amount longer than the people who were nominated but didn't win. There's no difference between them in any other respect, right? I mean, it's random, basically. Once you've been nominated, it's a, it's a um, flip of whatever. It's, it's a lottery whether you're going to win. Um, in every major category, winners outlive, on average, outlive the uh, nominees who didn't win by four years. That's the equivalent of being immune to coronary heart disease, right? There's one exception, which is screenwriters. Screenwriters who win uh, um, Academy Awards live no longer than screenwriters who are nominated and don't win. Um, and the conjecture is that the reason is they, whereas actors are actors and film directors are film directors, screenwriters are just uh, frustrated novelists. Um, so they don't really feel like they uh, are doing something that's worthwhile. Okay. So let's go back to Miss Higgins. She's going to ask us now, okay, Brighouse, you've told us something about flourishing, you've told, us, you've told me something about what it means, but it is not very helpful to tell me, well, what you should do when you're teaching is you should teach children in ways that enable them to flourish and um, contribute appropriately to the flourishing of others. Well, I want to, she says, I want to hear more. Um, and so I'll tell you a bit more or I'll tell her a bit more. But first, you know, there's one thought, which is she shouldn't be told anymore. I mean, it's not as though... Uh, it's not as though teaching is brain surgery or anything like that. Um, and I agree with that. My dad once said that to me. He said, teaching's not brain surgery. Um, it's more important than brain surgery, and it's more difficult than brain surgery. And that's why she needs help. She needs a whole sort of social network that is... She mustn't be just left uh, alone in her classroom to figure out what to do for herself. Um, just as I mustn't be left in my classroom to figure out what to do for myself. You need a kind of set of guidelines. You need a, a, a conversation among people um, about what, what, what you're actually going to be doing. Um, why? How is it that brain surgery is more important and more difficult? Um, uh, so, sorry, how is it that teaching is more important and more difficult than brain surgery? So I'm going to give, give you some pictures, and you can see. So look, here you have the teacher, and there you have the brain surgeon. So what the brain surgeon is doing, as my dad told me, this is when I was about 16, what the brain surgeon is doing is he's just restoring the person to their original functioning. He's trying to, he's trying to get them to be normal, basically. Right? He's not, uh, of course, he's saving their lives in lots of cases. That's handy. Um, and I'm not saying I wouldn't go to a brain surgeon if I need the brain surgery, nothing like that. But he's transforming them. He's transforming their lives. He's turning them from little barbarians, which is what you are when you're born. I mean, when you're born, you're pathetic. You can't do a thing. Have you seen babies? They can't feed themselves, they can't open doors, they're just, they, 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 they're useless. Um, they can't even talk. Uh, um, as they get older, you're transforming their minds. Left to themselves, they would not be able to do any of the complex, interesting things that we do. Right? We've developed a huge sort of social product, uh, literacy, numeracy, uh, art, science, um, and extremely complex, intimate relationships uh, that you can't just... You know, if you just entered the world at 16 or 18, you'd be lost. You need education to transform you into the kind of person who can really live a life. So it's more important. It's also more difficult. So here you can see... Here's Miss Higgins. Oh, I've got Miss Higgins back again. And there's Mr Higgins. Okay. <laughs> So look at what Mr. Higgins is doing. 
he's just, he is actually a brain surgeon. I don't know why he's, why he's on the leg. But uh, um, uh, maybe he's not a very good one. I don't know. Um, but, uh, or maybe it's a soccer player. Uh, he anesthetized the patient. Okay? He's just fiddling around inside. Not only did he anesthetize the patient so he wouldn't have to deal with the patient complaining or not paying attention or not wanting to get well or whatever. He's got all these other people standing around, handing him things, helping him out, watching him, right? And here's Miss Higgins. There's nobody helping her, and she, she hasn't anesthetized any of them, <laughs> right? They're there. They're all sort of in the room, getting ready to cause trouble, getting ready not to pay attention. I mean, she doesn't have my son in that room, but, you know, she's probably got one or two who are like my son, trying to stop each other from paying attention, some of them hungry when they came in the room. Um, it's much more difficult. The complex array of skills that you need in order not just to manage those 30 people, because that's not enough. You have to do that, because nothing else is going to happen if you don't manage them, but you have to make them learn as well. And you've got to make them to learn things that 200 years ago nobody knew how to do. Right? It's not like these are things that are natural. She is engaged in this extremely complex, unnatural uh, activity with these unanesthetized living beings uh, that are trying to get in the way. Right? So, she reasonably wants help. Uh, so, I'm not sure I'm going to give her a lot of help, but I'll say something. So I think what, what I've tried to do is break down um, the uh, break down the idea of flourishing into a series of capacities really, um, or, or abilities. Right? So when you're thinking about how to design a school, when you're thinking about what to do in the classroom, when you're thinking about your cur curriculum, um, uh, and even when you're thinking about your extracurriculum, what will... Um, uh, what kind of clubs will we have? What kind of teachers will we employ? What kind of enthusiasms will we try and um, uh, represent? Um, uh, you'd be thinking about these abilities that you want to foster in children. So you're really thinking about developing knowledge, skills, attitudes, and dispositions. Right? Knowledge being sort of the kind of uh, propositional, you know, I know that... Uh, I know that Scotland is still part of the United Kingdom, right? Skills, the ability to, the ability which I clearly lack to uh, handle a, there's, no, there's nothing, I can't tell you anything about this, and evidently I can't even do it very well, but the ability to create a PowerPoint or handle a um, computer, the ability to ride a bicycle. Attitudes and dispositions, um, uh, ways of feeling about other people in the world, Schools are trying to develop those in children and uh, inclinations to act on those feelings in particular uh, situations. So the first... So, so each of these capacities that I'll describe, um, you want to sort of key those... Uh, the, the, the knowledge, skills, attitudes and dispositions, of course, overlap. There are some that will um, contribute to all of these capacities. But you want to think about that, uh, what knowledge, um, skills, attitudes, and dispositions you're going to develop by thinking about these abilities. So the first is the ability to make and act on one's own independent judgments about those things that really matter um, uh, and make those judgments well. So what are your own judgments there? Here's, I'll give you an example with my, my daughter. So my daughter goes to... She just went off to college, which uh, was another thing, fleeing the nest that I identified with in the poem. Um, uh, but she went to a high school, which is about three blocks from my house, where I think in uh, 2008, I think 90% of the people in the surrounding area, the area that the high school draws from, voted for Obama in uh, 2008, right? And every single kid in that high school, and I know a remarkable number of them, every single kid in that high school I've talked to believes uh, in the right to abortion. Um, and enough of them spend enough time in my house that I 
have discussions with them. And of those children so far, not one of them can last more than a minute and a half with me if I challenge them. So I don't challenge them because I don't agree with them. I challenge them on all sorts of things. I challenge them because I don't think they've thought about it. And they haven't. They've, uh, they believe in the right to abortion because everybody they've ever known has believed in the right to abortion, not because they've thought it out, not because they've thought out what, wh why that might matter or what the case against it might be. Um, you don't want your children making judgments that are just a, uh, are the result of received opinion, that are just mirroring what they've imbued from, uh, have come from society or just from you. You want them making their own independent judgments. You also, if you're sensible, um, want them to be able to participate effectively in the economy. You want them to be able to make a contribution. Some people won't be able to, um, but most of us can if we develop the right kinds of uh, capacities. You also, if you're sensible, want them to have the ability to have good, intimate, mutually loving relationships. You want their, um, uh, you want their, ideally, you want their relationships with you to be a success. Uh, but if that's going to be a screw-up, at least you want them to have uh, loving relationships with other people that are successful, and you want them to be able to have successful relationships with their own children. You want them to have friends, and you want those friends to be loyal and uh, uh, constant. Um, one, of my, one of my daughter's uh, problem. my daughter's gone off to college, as they say. Um, I'm very close to my daughter, and... Uh, She's not totally happy. It's the, the, first, the first semester. And I think one of the things is, you know, she, uh, unlike me, when I went off to college, I didn't really miss anything. Um, but she had parents who liked her and paid attention to her. Um, and she had a whole group of friends who she'd known since she, were five. she was five. And I tell you, some of them, I mean, some of her friends, God, she was lucky to have them. I can't imagine why they hung around uh, her like that. Um, and you can't replicate that easily. Um, but I'm glad. I'm glad she feels kind of annoyed and unhappy and lonely right now um, because it shows that she had the right kinds of uh, experiences um, up to this point, or at least some of them. You also want them to have the ability to participate responsibly and reasonably in political decision-making. You want them to be able to uh, scrutinize candidates, scrutinize the platforms that candidates um, uh, put forward, you want them to be able to uh, maybe even uh, put themselves forward as candidates. Um, you want them to be able to distinguish the truth from the sort of, not exactly the truth from the lies and the truth from the sort of semi-truth uh, which they're often presented with. You also want them to have the ability to be emotionally open, generous and kind. I think kindness is a much underestimated uh, virtue. Um, kindness is a bit annoying if other people are not being kind. Um, but if we could all just be a little kinder to each other, um, I think that would go a long way. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say something. Uh, I'm, I promise you, I'm not going to lead you through each of these and break them down even further. But I'm going to say something about a couple of them. Um, and I'm going to say, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about schools and uh, uh, educational sort of policy issues. I mean, really briefly, I'll talk about uh, three of them um, in the light of uh, what I've said. So the first one I want to talk about um, is the ability to participate uh, effectively in the economy. So this, exactly what you need in order to be able to do that changes a lot over time. Uh, and we're in a time in which a great number of uh, tasks that are routine um, or a, a, great, a, a great number of sort of com uh, computational tasks have really been taken over by computers or robots. These are robots. Um, uh, and what human beings, so many of the things that we used to need human beings to know how to do, we don't really need them to know how to do now. Um, human beings, if they're going to make themselves useful, have to do the things that only they can do and computers can't do. Um, and those have to do with problem solving, they have to be, uh, do with identifying the parameters of problems so that they can solve them. They have to do with relationships, they have to do with um, uh, um, 
being able to get people to do things who you can't force to do things. It's relatively easy to be able to get things to do things when you've got a gun, and they, I mean, it's not that easy, but it's, you know, it's easier if you've got a gun and they are able to do them, but most of the time you're not in that situation. Um, uh, we're trying to get other people to do things by persuading them to do things, by giving reasons. Computers are very bad at giving reasons. Um, one of the, uh, one of my students uh, from last uh, year, um, her, her, her parents are in the audience because she was able to persuade them to come to the um, uh, talk without actually forcing them to. Um, and uh, one of the things that was brilliant was about 10 weeks into her first semester as a freshman, she was giving a presentation with a group and they set up a, um, they set up a, a dilemma um, and they wanted, to get, um, they wanted to get the other students to discuss it and I just sat back and let them do it. And the student said, uh, she elaborated the question and she said, I want to know what you think and why you think it. I want you to give reasons. And that was sort of one of those moments in teaching where you think, yeah, you, you know exactly what it is that people should be doing. Um, uh, in order to do these things, uh, we need people to have specific sk knowledge and skills, specific to the tasks. We need them to be able to address uh, unforeseen problems with diverse strategies. Honestly, when I learned history in high school for two years, all of my learning of history was a teacher reading out his notes and us writing them down. That's extraordinary. He read out his notes and we wrote them down. It was dictation and we did that for two years. That was not learning how to address unforeseen problems with diverse strategies. Um, it's really handy in life to have this uh, third skill, but it's really handy in the economy. And it's something that schools can do. Uh, maybe schools, so there are, I, I mean, I think students in a way fall into two, uh, maybe three categories. There's the students who learn how to concentrate single-mindedly on an unwelcome activity for about 30 minutes. There are students who never learn that. And then there are the really bad students, like me, who learn how to do it for four or five hours. And uh, they are emotionally unhealthy people. You should not uh, trust somebody who has that capacity. Um, the ability to coordinate others with others. Um, uh, empathy. A sense of your own worth and of the worth of others. A friend of mine who teaches at Harvard, um, said to me, you know, Harry, we, there are two kinds of students in the world. There are students who need to learn that they're just as important as everybody else, and there are the students who need to learn that they're no more important than anyone else. And he said, and I only teach one of those kinds of students. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I actually teach a lot of the other kind. Um, and I added this in just, uh, I, I added this into the PowerPoint today, because I so I, I should say something about this. Command of your personal finances is tremendously important in order to be able to control your participation in the economy. There are people who over-participate in the economy because they don't have control of their personal finances. They are spending more um, than they really want to spend. Um, and they're in debt, um, and they need to manage that. So that's one, uh, that's the capacity for um, participating in the economy. Now let's look, sorry, I'm pointing the wrong place. So now let's look at what you need in order to have healthy personal relationships. And uh, you can see, I, I came across, you know, this relates closely, I think, to the, the poem we saw. Um, I was standing outside, I, there's a classroom right by my office, and uh, I walked out the other day and there were... I know, 10, 12 students sitting waiting for a class, and every single one of them was doing this. Right? Not one of them looked at any of the others, and not one of them looked at me until I broke in and said, are you all texting each other? And one of them said, yeah, that'd be a really good idea. Uh, family life is extremely complex. Uh, most, uh, around 50% of marriages end in divorce. Um, there are probably... Uh, um, some that shouldn't, and there are others that uh, maybe should have ended earlier. Um, uh, among 
Friendships are complicated and difficult in a very sort of speeded up, uh, high stress society. Um, and again, schooling can do something to help people cope with that. Um, and uh, not cope with, actually enjoy familial relationships, actually enjoy friendships. Um, so what do you want um, in order to get your children, in order to get our children to have this capacity? They need to learn how to balance work with life. Uh, I, I um, you know, the Austrians famously think that the Germans live to work, whereas they, the Austrians, work to live. And you want your children to work to live, not to live to work. Um, that's a very European thing to say. I just say I'm, I'm an American citizen now, so you can't complain. Uh, you shouldn't have let me in if you didn't uh, want to hear that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on children, risky behaviors, um, and how we should stop children engaging in risky behaviors. And of course, I know what that means. You know, they shouldn't be taking too many drugs, or they shouldn't be drinking too much, or whatever. Um, uh, but falling in love is incredibly risky. And uh, I, I worry about, I mean, I worry about children who are not willing to take risks, um, who are not willing to risk really being intimate with other people who are not willing to take the risk that is involved in trusting other people. In order to be able to have successful emotional relationships, you need uh, to be able to trust. Not everybody learns how to do these things well in the home. Um, and for some people, school is the place where this is going to be fostered uh, properly. You want kindness, knowledge about what works. Uh, we actually have a lot of information about... Um, what uh, enables people to um, have successful marriages, how people can have uh, enjoyable friendships. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't know. I mean, the thing that they do in high schools now, um, they do this sort of parenting thing where they give children a, a baby, a doll, that screams all the time or something, and they have to look after the doll. And you know the you do understand the point of that, right? The point of that is not so that they'll learn how to be parents, it's so that they will decide not to be parents yet, right? It's basically a contraceptive device. Um, uh, and I'm all, you know, that's fine, I don't care about that. Um, but actually learning something about how really to care for real people, um, uh, we can teach some of that. Um, and again, command of <laughs> lots of marriages falter because one or both of the partners don't have command of their personal finances. It sounds like, a, sounds like I'm going to advertise a, you know, some sort of credit card at the end or something. I'm, I'm not. Um, so I could, break down, I could break things down more with some of the other capacities, but I'm not going to because you don't want to hear me go on and on and on. And I've still got a couple more things I want to say about actual schoolings. schooling. So I wanted to look at three issues very briefly um, uh, that two of which I think arise very commonly in, in, in our um, sort of debates about schooling, and one of which I doesn't arise at all, but I think, oh, I just want to put it on your agenda um, for a moment. So the first uh, will be standards and testing. You all know that we have the Common Core standards um, being adopted right now, um, and that there's going to be a testing regime associated with that. Second is the lunch break, this is the one that nobody's talking about. You'll see why I'm talking about that in a moment. Um, and the third is online instruction. I'm just going to say a couple of words about online instruction. So, uh, the Common Core State Standards for Literacy and for Math uh, have been published for about two or three years now, and there's a great deal of sort of mo movement now toward uh, adopting them. Um, and basing testing in the states on these standards. Now, if you, they're, they're, they're online. If you have a computer, if you haven't sold it to buy an engagement ring, um, you, can, uh, you can go online and read them. Don't do it just this minute. Um, personally, I think the standards are pretty good. Um, they're better than most state standards. Um, and I think there are lots of reasons which we can either talk about or not later. Uh, for thinking it's a good idea to have uh, standards and measures. Um, but 
there's a real danger with testing, and it's a danger that's been going... I mean, the Common Core standards don't increase this. Um, there are a number of different dimensions of learning. And the dimension of learning that we're happy about testing is knowledge, and maybe to some extent skills. But we do not test attitudes and dispositions, right? Um, at least uh, those that uh, don't have anything to do with um, uh, immediately with learning. The danger is that policymakers, I mean, not just policymakers, everybody, when you've got precise data about something, even though you know that that thing is not the only thing that matters, you focus on that thing, and you often ignore the thing that you don't have data on that you know matters just as much, right? Uh, and um, emotional, moral, and spiritual development matter just as much, and schools, I think, can do a great deal about them, maybe not as much as they can uh, with respect to cognitive learning, um, uh, as cognitive learning does. Uh, but we have a cultural bias, I think, toward the cognitive, and I'm not, by we, I mean we in the uh, uh, rich West. Um, we don't know much uh, about the emotions, uh, ab about emotional and moral learning, and we know even less about how to test emotional and moral learning. And because we don't know about much about that, we don't know much about how to teach, uh, how to foster emotional and moral learning, not in a systematic way. And my big worry about tests, and uh, about testing especially, um, is its tendency to focus attention on what is tested to the exclusion of those things that matter just as much that we're not as good at testing. And I will just say, you know, some of this may be just sort of, some of this stuff may be immeasurable, um, but we don't know for sure because we haven't spent billions and billions of dollars over the last 70 years learning how to test them. Our billions and billions of dollars across the rich West have been spent on figuring out how to test uh, basic, very basic cognitive uh, 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 knowledge and skills. Okay. Okay, I guess I've got uh, some comments about online instruction, um, which I will... Uh, online instruction is an, in, in, an inevitable part of our um, sort of educational experience now. Uh, I'm... I'm among the probably most uh, technology averse. Um, and, you know, the, the poem that we saw really captures a lot of my feelings about the world we've entered. But I'm not, I'm not crazy. I do understand that we have entered that world. And although I'd like people to turn off from it a lot more, uh, there are things that are going to happen uh, online, including education. And to be honest, you know, I teach, I teach at a, a great university. It's the first American university I ever heard of in my life. I never would have thought I'd be able to teach there. It's an amazing privilege. But a lot of our 400-person lecture classes are no better than that. So a, a lot of our 400-person lecture, person lecture classes, not a lot of learning is going on, in my opinion. I don't know because we never bothered to find out, but I'm pretty sure not a lot of learning is going on. Um, but in our 20-person classes, and even in our 80-person classes, there's real learning going on, that some of which could not possibly be going on uh, through online instruction. So think back to the student who was making a presentation to our classmates who were in the room, who devised, who, who basically had to do a lesson plan, who had devised a puzzle, and then was asking them for reasons, and then when they were offering reasons, was evaluating and countering those reasons. It's incredibly hard. It's hard to make that happen in a classroom. Making that happen online, I just don't think you can. And it's not to do with uh, cognitive development. It's to do with the, uh, the emotional interactions, the kind of self-confidence that you have to develop in order to say things to people who are really there in front of you, um, to compose and try and conduct a room uh, now, you'll say, some of you will say, well, that isn't happening a lot in our college classrooms, and it's happening even less in our high school classrooms. You know, maybe it's not happening as much as it should be doing, 
but it ain't happening online, right? Uh, all right, so, okay, now let's talk about the lunch break. I don't know why the lunch break, well, I don't know why my things have skipped. So this is, this is my little rant about the lunch break, and then I'll give you one more quote from a great philosopher, and then we'll be done. Um, uh, my little boy is in that picture. Doesn't he look cute? Um, he comes home, and he's hungry. Every day that he comes home, he's hungry, and I take out his lunch that I made him in the morning, and there's you know, three quarters of it left. Uh, and he is a little kid. He's a really tiny little kid. Um, the one in the middle is uh, two years younger than the other two and is bigger than either of the other two. Um, uh, and mine is a very small little eight-year-old. But um, I ask him, he says, well, they only give us 12 minutes to eat our lunch. And I know that's true. I know it's not, he's not making this up. And so I say, I mean, I, obviously, we've only had this conversation once. It, unlike many of our conversations, which we have many times, and we might as well only have once because he never pays attention. But in this case, so why didn't you eat it in 12 minutes? Because I was talking to my friends, and they tell us not to talk to our friends. This is emblematic of a lot of what happens in school. So a lot of what you, what, when you think about school, you think about um, the tests and you think about uh, um, the textbooks and you think about the teacher teaching in the classroom, but a lot of learning goes on in the lunchroom. And what he's learning, he's learning about food. He's learning that food is there to be stuffed down you, not to be enjoyed. You just get it and you shove it in as fast as you can Right? Now, I know that there are industries that are based on that idea, right? I mean, I know that there are people who are quite keen on that. Now, that's not the lesson I want him to learn, right? I want him to learn that food is to be savoured, to be enjoyed, and I especially want him to learn the other lesson that he's not learning. He's learning that it's to be shoved down in a totally solitary, isolated way, disconnected from other people. And I want him to learn, no, food is something to be savoured and enjoyed in the company of other people. Um, uh, the experiences that we enjoy the most are those that we share with others. Uh, and I want him to learn that that is part of every, you know, that's part of the everyday life, of, uh, is being interacting with others and enjoying things uh, together with them. Um, I did, uh, um, you know, I did have dinner with the committee beforehand and I was really glad when they asked me because it's so weird to come and give a talk and just sort of walk on stage and give a talk and not have it actually really sort of met anybody properly. It was really nice. The food was extremely good, I have to say, but even if the food hadn't been very good, the company was good, and that was what mattered. No, the food mattered too, actually. But it didn't. Uh, okay. So remember Nixon. So he, he gave the argument that I didn't like. He, he, he gave the argument for educating that I didn't like. So I thought what I'd do is present a sort of counter quote, um, which I really love. Um, uh, and it's, uh, this is somebody opening um, uh, an office for educational research. Uh, to achieve accountability for educational improvement and justice, it will be necessary to develop broader and more sensitive measurements of learning than we now have. This, the, the organization would lead to the developing of these new measurements of educational output. In doing so, it should pay as much heed to what are called the immeasurables of schooling largely because no one has yet learned to measure them, such as responsibility, wit, and humanity, as it does to verbal and mathematical achievement. Um, putting emphasis, really sort of developing responsibility, wit, and humanity, uh, the unplugged theme here, it does require that people go unplugged for significant periods of time. Uh, you don't develop these things staring in front of a screen. Um, it also makes lots of demands on the school um, and on the researchers who think about the school. Um, so I really like this uh, quote. Do you know who it is? I'm nearly done. I'm going to stop in a minute. So you, you can just shout out if you want. No, it's not me. No, no, I wouldn't quote, I wouldn't, I wouldn't quote myself. Um, huh? It does sound like a Mr. Rogersy kind of thing, doesn't it? I hadn't thought of that. Um, actually, it's uh, Richard Nixon. Um, by now, he was president. Uh, and um, I was like, you know, I, I, he, 
I remember coming across this quote and being so struck by it. Um, uh, and I wish that his successors as president would have paid a bit more attention um, to this part of the educational um, enterprise. So I'm done now. So, I mean, the only, there's a kind of movement which I'm a little, I, I'm kind of in supportive of, but a little uneasy about as well, um, a, a movement um, around uh, what they call character education uh, now, and it's being sort of led by, uh, mainly by academics, but also by the, the Knowledge is Power Program Charter Schools, KIPP. Um, uh, the, the academics, sort of in the head of it, uh, uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist called Jim Heckman and a psychologist called Angela Duckworth, who's at, who's at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, they talk about grit, they talk about zest, they talk about these various sort of, you know, these sort of personality connected traits. And what KIPP has done um, is they've introduced a report card which teachers are expected to fill out every week which lists, I have it, you know, if I, I have it on my computer somewhere, you, you can look it up. It has 30 different traits, um, you know, does she try hard, uh, is her behavior, you know, is she treating other people responsibly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And teachers are expected to fill that out every week for every kid. And these are middle schools, so they see, you know, so we're talking about each teacher has 30 kids, basically. Um, uh, and the way it's used in the schools um, is to monitor, not to judge the kid, but to monitor what's going on, right? So, you know, basically we're finding out from the teachers whether they think things are getting better or worse along these dimensions. And what we're also doing is getting the teachers to be thinking about this. Right? And that's, that's, as a parent, my concern, because I feel like there's so much push yeah. from the standards and all that kind of thing that the teachers, you know, feel that pressure that they have to... I know. I, I agree. I mean, I agree. I think it's a big. What, I think what we need is we need a countervailing force. So, I, like I say, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to the standards or the testing, but whenever, you, but but if you implement those, you can then say, oh, but we also care about responsibility, wit, and humanity. But if you're not doing anything to sort of concretely give people incentives to pay attention to those things, the incentives associated with the standards that you do have are going to obliterate everything else, right? Um, and as, uh, as policy makers, but also as parents, as communities, we need to push on, uh, and lots of teachers really welcome this. They want to be pushed away from a relentless focus on these standards, while also understanding they, they, they need to focus on the standards. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm European, so I mean, in fact, the, I, I, I think it is a bit odd to expect that five-year-olds can read, for example. I didn't read till I was eight. I mean, I, you know, I get worried about my son because he's eight and he can't really read. And then my mum says, yeah, but you didn't read at all till you were eight. Well, you couldn't read at all. Um, and it's not like I, you know, I've, I can read, you know. I, I, I did learn how to read. 
I learned how to tie my shoelaces. I don't do it very often, but I learned that. You know, I also couldn't do that until I was about 12, uh, but I did learn how to do it. Uh, it's not like there was some big worry about, you know, about it. So I, uh, kids develop at very uneven rates, and, and I, I worry about, and teachers worry a lot about sort of being pushed to this sort of lockstep kind of uh, development. Other questions for Mary? So I think with lunch break, I mean, lunch break needs to be longer. Like we, so I do think kids should spend, I mean, American kids spend less time in school than any other kids. And actually, if you look at the, if you look at the buildings they're forced to be in, maybe that's not such a bad thing, you know. But uh, kids in the, rest, in the rest of the developed world, you know, spend more time in school. Um, and they're, instruction, you know, they're instructed more. Um, they don't watch as, you know, my daughter left high school having watched Finding Nemo six times in, you know, she, they weren't, didn't even have a watch, watching Casablanca, you know, they were making a watch Finding Nemo over and over again when they weren't instructing them. So that, that's, that, that's probably a bad thing. We should probably have more of that. But also more time, you know, it's ridiculous to think. You, you need to be spending time in the lunchroom with other kids long enough to be talking to them and eating. Um, and you need to uh, have other time out. You know, all no school should think that a kid should be back in the classroom after less than an hour. Right? A kid should be outside of the classroom for an hour at lunchtime. You know, if both parents... I mean, I, what, can I, what can I say about both? Parents are under lots of stress, uh, and it's stressful raising kids. Um, it's stressful having most of the jobs that most people have, and I've just said, you know, I have this incredibly low stress job relatively. Um, uh, if you can't cook, then don't cook. But find time. I mean, f take time from other things, including away from, uh, you know, the iPad or whatever, um, and sit around a table. Or if you don't have a table, sit around on the floor and eat together and talk together and get your children expecting. You know, eating is not a chore. Um, it's, it's, it's a social activity that you do with other people. And if you can't, you know, do it yourself. It's entirely possible for, you know, three or four families to eat together with one family taking the responsibility for doing the cooking so families are not the size they used to be. We're not talking about, you know, 24 people when three families eat together. We're talking about 12. Um, uh, have one person take responsibility, do, you know, get a division of labor going. Um, so I, I would like to see that more. But, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to tell other people what to do. I'm trying, trying to tell to schools school. what to do. Any other questions? Yes. As far as this, this concept, this philosophy, do you, do you see the bigger hurdle as not knowing how to teach it effectively or not being able to measure it well enough to have results? I think, they, I think they're connected. So, I think, so one of the reasons I think standards and testing are a good thing is that it enables you to find out whether, where the learning is happening. And finding out where the learning is happening is an important um, uh, mechanism for figuring out who's doing it well. And figuring out who's doing it well is really important for figuring out how to do it, right? So I want to know which of my colleagues are better than I am at teaching, uh, you know, arguments for the, uh, for the uh, existence of God. I, I don't mean getting the students to believe there's a God, but teaching about those arguments. Why? Because I, I want to learn how to do it better. And the way you learn how to do things better is watching other people who do them better, do them. Um, and you need some sort of mechanism. I can't find out who's successful just by saying, are you successful? Because actually with teaching, you don't know whether you're successful, really. 
unless you've got some sort of independent measures. So if we don't have measures, one of the reasons that Nixon... You know, it's weird quoting Nixon favorably. Just, it's sort of weird, you know, relying on him as an, as an authority. Um, but let's do that for a minute. You know, one of the reasons he, he is concerned about getting the measurements is because he knows that getting the measurements, A, is important for getting people to pay attention, and B, is actually important for learning better how to do it. And same with the KIPP schools, the, the Knowledge is Power program schools that I, that I mentioned. You know, they, they want to learn who's doing a better job because they want all their teachers to be able to do a better job at that. Um, and learning who's doing a better job is, is important for being able to know who should be developing the professional development, who should be watching whom, et cetera. So they, they go together. At the same time, I think there are really obvious things, like not having children... I just think it's obvious what the lessons are from making kids eat, eat lunch in 12 minutes in silence. I don't think it needs a fantastic amount of you know, high-quality research to, to figure out what's going on there. Yes? Hi, uh, just a question. Uh, I keep reading and hearing about kind of a, a gender gap in terms of educational achievement. And I about her life, and I guess my, my question to you is, do you agree with that? Is that true? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it seems like the generation shifted from college was mostly men, mostly applicants, and candidates, mostly entries in grad school, etc. And they say, the good thing that this caught up on is that we're going to have to set for that. They say, now it's going the other way, and young men aren't yeah. uh, themselves. So is it true? And if so, what can we do about it? So it's absolutely true. So one interpretation is that women are just smarter than men, right? So that's what people always used to say when men were ahead. They used to say, well, men are just smarter than women. Um, and, you know, but if you look at women, if you look at what, you know, if you give women roughly the same sort of nutrition, roughly the same sort of health care, roughly the same sort of stresses, they live about four, year long, four years longer than men. I don't think it's that surprising. I don't think it would be that surprising if you take all the sort of discrimination away and all of the culture away that they would outperform men intellectually as well. Um, but let's, even if that's true, um, there's still a problem because most people are heterosexual and these women are going to marry uh, men and raise children with men. And the gap is very, I think it's very, very worrying. Um, it's worrying, and it's worrying for the women because, you know, women, have, the culture, I take, it's going to take a long time for the culture to catch up. The culture is that women have traditionally looked for partners who out-achieve them educationally, right? There's a period in the 50s when women were sort of achieving pretty similarly with men in the US, only in the US, not anywhere else. Um, but, you know, that was a time when you could get a family wage... If you were male, you could get a family wage job at, by leaving school at age 16 with a career ladder. And, you know, we're not in that world or anything close to it. And if women want to marry men who can out-earn them, um, they're, you know, your daughter's generation, we're not in that world, you know. So Madison is about 55, 45, and it's about 55, 45, despite the fact that I'm certain, and no, I have not spoken, I've deliberately not spoken to anyone in admissions at UW-Madison because I don't want to have knowledge about that, but I've talked to lots of admissions people at other places that are similar, and they all say that they practice affirmative action for boys. So they all say the only way they keep to 45% of boys is by making it easier for boys to get in than girls, right? Um, and if you, talk to, if you talk to your daughters, I mean, if you talk to your high school age and young college age kids in Wisconsin, they will all, they'll all say that fits with their experience of sort of who they know who's gotten into places and hasn't gotten into places. Um, not, the, you know, not the Ivy Leagues, I mean, not the sort of top 0.1% of selectivity, but everybody else. Um, uh, it's a huge problem. I think that very early, I mean, I, I hesitate to say these things. Like, I don't know what's going on. I do think boys probably suffer more from the sort of uh, behavioral rigors that are imposed in kindergarten to second grade. Um, I, 
either because they're naturally more boisterous or because they're acculturated to, or, you know, or girls are acculturated to being nicer um, uh, and better behaved. Uh, so maybe boys suffer from that. Um, but, and maybe we have a, cultural, a culture of masculinity that really is damaging to boys. You know, as one of my colleagues said, boys seem to have a hard time getting things finished and handed in. And he said, and most women, if you talk to them, will say that fits their experience, right? So I, yeah, I, sorry, I'm rambling. I think it's a huge problem. And the facts are very, very clear and, and very stark. Another question? Perry, thank you. Thanks.